All right. If, I want to welcome you to the uh, live webinar from Samaritan's Purse put on by, it's called the Samaritan's Purse International Health Forum. And uh, we want to welcome you all aboard today. I want to say, first of all, and up front, Merry Christmas to you. It's, uh, it is the season of his first coming, and we're all looking forward to his second coming. So Merry Christmas to you. Uh, today, uh, we have, uh, you know, want to welcome you uh, to the forum and then, you know, hope that, you know, that you all participate in the conversation today. Uh, Dr. Nugent, as he speaks, uh, you can type questions that may come up uh, or come to mind in the chat window, which is located on my screen, at least over to the right. And I and, uh, want to invite you to do that. Uh, what we'll do is accumulate those, uh, those questions and then we will uh, uh, Forward them to Dr. Nugent at the begin at the end of, of his presentation. I want to welcome Dr. Nugent to, to the to the group, and I want to tell you a little bit about this uh, young man. Uh, I say young because uh, I'm pushing 80, and uh, he is he, he's where I would like to be. But uh, Lord is going to call me home when I when he wants to, and I'm I'm anxious to go. Uh, Dr. Nugent uh, Dylan Nugent uh, is uh, presenting today on the close treatment of common fractures and dislocations. Uh, Dr. Nugent is a board certified orthopedic surgeon. Recently completed the World Medical Missions Post Residency Program out in Tenwick Hospital in Kenya. And he's also served as the Associate Director of the PAACS Orthopedic Surgery Residency at Tenwick. Uh, he is a volunteer global faculty member with Loma Linda University and is the husband and father of four sons and a daughter. Uh, you know, I, we were chatted a little bit about his little daughter before, you know, at the, just before this, we went on. Uh, currently, Dr. Nugent and his family are on furlough and preparing to complete an orthopedic trauma fellowship prior to returning to Kenya with the long-term goal of serving in the missions field. And with that, uh, I want to, you know, remind you once again, uh, questions to the right and, and the chat window, and we will uh, present those to Dr. Nugent. And with that, I'll introduce Dr. Nugent now. Thank you, Dr. Wood. Again, welcome to everyone. Um, it's my privilege to share with you about something that's very near and dear to my heart, uh, treatment of fractures and dislocations. Um, as you can see on our welcome slide, it says Karibuni, which is uh, Kiswahili for welcome to you all. So uh, just adding my, my welcome. Um, again, the title of this presentation is The Closed Treatment of Common Fractures and Dislocations. Uh, Fractures and dislocations are common, and some of them are even more common than others. So my, my purpose today is really just to give an overview of some of the more common injuries uh, that anyone may encounter, whether you're working in an ER, covering call, or uh, out serving in the mission field. Uh, as Dr. Wood mentioned, I served as the uh, assistant program director uh, for the orthopedic residency program in uh, Tenwick Hospital the last three years. My objectives today are to, uh, to uh, enable the listener or the participant to be familiar with the basic protocols for closed treatment of fractures and dislocations, both in adults and in children, as well as to uh, be able to describe the typical mechanisms by which these uh, injuries can occur. I'd also like you to be able to recognize common neurovascular injuries associated with specific uh, fractures and dislocations. And then you should also get a, a basic understanding of evaluation, reduction, immobilization, and even appropriate imaging uh, when treating patients with these injuries. So just a brief overview, we're going to start by uh, showing you a few of the protocols that I've used um, to teach and to guide our residents and our uh, clinic staff at Tenwick Hospital for the treatment and follow-up of both adults and children. Uh, and after that, uh, we'll discuss some of the specific injuries and some of the, the principles of how to treat them and evaluate them. Uh, and this, was, this talk grew out of uh, basically a how to survive and thrive on ortho call for our, our trainees. But again, it, sh it should apply to anyone who uh, sees musculoskeletal injuries in any practice environment. To begin with, to kind of set the stage, I'd like to uh, take a few minutes to uh, just explain some basic orthopedic principles or what we like to call the orthopedic commandments. The number one uh, is thou shalt not varus. Uh, 
for anyone who doesn't understand what varus is, if you think of an anatomic model uh, standing with the arms at, at the patient's side and the palms facing forward, varus is anything that takes the axis of a limb and puts it toward the midline. Uh, so you can imagine that would put it in a, in a way that could impair someone's function. So the second commandment is like the first, thou shalt not internally rotate. If you imagine taking your feet and internally rotating, turning your toes inward towards each other, as we might say uh, in layman's terms to be pigeon-toed, you're much more likely to trip over your feet. Uh, whereas if you turn them outwardly in a more duck-footed pattern, you're much more likely to be able to uh, clear your, your gait cycle without uh, impediment. So to state that another way, the third commandment is thou shalt immobilize in the position of function whenever possible. And what that means is that you're trying to take into account how your patient will um, function not only during their time of immobilization or casting, but even after that, uh, given a, a particular injury pattern, assuming you may uh, incur some disability or at least some temporary stiffness um, after the injury, you want to optimize your patient's recovery beginning with your initial treatment. So we'll go on to the next slide. Uh, the um, A few more important maxims to uh, keep in mind. You don't have to be strong as an ox, but it may help to be twice as smart when doing orthopedics. Uh, so leverage is more important than strength. Um, understanding the principles of leverage will make your job much easier and um, Sometimes it's a matter of simple principles, not always easy, but simple uh, in terms of keeping the idea of leverage and what forces you need to overcome when performing a reduction or maintaining a reduction in a splint. Another uh, common orthopedic saying is a crooked cast makes a straight bone. And, and what that means is that uh, when uh, applying a splint or a cast, if you just apply it to the shape of the bone, you may not uh, be counteracting the forces that cause the deformity in the first place. So you want to apply a well-molded splint uh, with three points of molding to allow for uh, maintenance of the position that you've put the, the bones back into or the joint back into when realigning it. And remember, when making a cast or a splint, this is not a benign procedure. You can cause greater harm uh, with an improperly placed splint or cast without proper padding or with uh, too much pressure on bony prominences or uh, by not putting it in a proper position for good function. Uh, and, and the bottom line is, in the end, you want to make it pretty. Make it, make it look clean and neat so that it's not uh, falling apart and doing your patients further uh, disservice by having uh, to have it remade or uh, having issues with uh, comfort and, and fit. So I like to sum that all up by saying excellent patient care doesn't happen by accident. Attention to detail is extremely important. I think we have scriptural basis for this, uh, even in, in evaluating our own work and, and our work ethic. Second Timothy says, study to show yourself approved to God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed. And he goes on to say, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so I think he's talking about scriptural and theological principles of the Christian life there. But if you take the first part of the verse to apply that to our, our general uh, work, we, we need to, to study and to learn and to do well. And further uh, in Colossians 3, whatever you do, whether that's orthopedics or internal medicine, uh, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive your inheritance um, and your rewards because you are serving the Lord Christ. So again, the, the real greatest commandments are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one is like it, and that is to love our neighbor as ourself. And that's what we're doing with our patients when we're taking care of patients. So we want to do that to our utmost uh, abilities. So these next couple slides are basically a, um, transposed from our Tenwick uh, fracture treatment protocols, which I've also made available as supplementary documents uh, to go along with this talk uh, for anyone who's interested in, in downloading them um, and using them or modifying them, please feel free. 
I'm going to go over them relatively quickly because they're, again, just principles to follow. They're not um, hard and fast. There are modifications to them. But in general, for an adult, after evaluation and proper um, workup of a patient who has a closed fracture or dislocation, the sequence of treatment will be to perform a reduction, have appropriate alignment documented on post-reduction radiographs, and then schedule the follow-up treatments, which will be, in most cases, one week, within one week of the reduction and the injury, so that you can repeat your exam, repeat your radiographs, check alignment, make sure that the splint is still in good condition, and make adjustments or modifications if needed. But generally speaking, you just wanna make sure that the status quo is maintained on that first appointment. Following that one week later, you'll have repeat x-rays and a clinical exam. Uh, if we could go back to the, the previous slide for a moment, uh, for the adults, we're still talking about adults. Um, the uh, third follow-up will be after four weeks, um, so six weeks from the injury, four weeks after the second follow-up. At that point, you want to have um, a good evaluation of the, of the fracture healing. So at that point, you can remove the cast or the splint. And if there's evidence of healing, bone, bony union, you can consider conversion to either a functional brace or a weight-bearing cast on a lower extremity and begin to advance activities. If not, continue with the treatment uh, and make your next appointment roughly six weeks later at 12 weeks and repeat the process. If there is still not evidence of healing, you can discuss surgery, but by 12 weeks, most fractures that are treated closed will have healed enough to release a patient from immobilization and progress their activities. In children, it's essentially the same follow-up pattern, um, but children just grow and heal more quickly. So again, after your initial workup, your reduction, first follow-up a week later, check your alignment, make sure the splint and cast or cast is in good condition which is often not the case in children because they wear them out, they pull them off, they get them wet. So if you have a wet cast, you need to change it because the padding uh, will macerate a child's skin and can cause further injury. Remind them not to stick things inside the cast or splint because that can cause further injury. And then begin that follow-up period again. If you've maintained your alignment, again, you can convert to a, a, um, the permanent or definitive cast treatment at around the second week. And by four weeks later, most children are able to have their cast or splint removed, get an x-ray, and then convert either to functional casting or bracing or even discontinue it in, in certain cases. If, if need be, you can go all the way to 12 weeks um, for certain injuries that take longer to heal. But generally speaking, you'll be done at that point. So now we'd like to move on to discuss some of the more specific injuries that anyone may encounter as you're evaluating patients with musculoskeletal injuries. One of the most common um, is a shoulder dislocation, which usually occurs in a young, healthy male as pictured here. Anterior dislocations are much more common than posterior dislocations, which are associated with convulsive type um, behavior, either from electrocution or um, seizure disorders. It is vital that you assess the axillary nerve by sensing over the lateral shoulder um, before and after reduction. After reduction, you can actually test motor function through the uh, activity of the deltoid, having the patient lift or abduct their arm gently to the side just to fire that muscle. Remember when assessing a patient, getting one view on an x-ray is really insufficient. Sometimes it may be obvious as in the x-ray noted, but sometimes uh, there may be a position of the, of the joint that makes it look like it's reduced, but on a, an axial view, either a scapular Y or axillary view, you will get the fuller picture that it's actually dislocated. So always two views. Having done that, um, you want, performing a reduction is the next step. That can be done with either an intraarticular block using lidocaine or at times uh, sedation, depending on the cooperativeness of the patient and your resources at your facility. There are many methods which we'll illustrate in a, a moment on the other slides, but once the, ex, once the uh, reduction has been performed, again, post-reduction x-rays are, are essential. And at this point, I really prefer an axillary uh, view as shown in the bottom right of this slide to ensure that the humeral head is articulating on the glenoid surface. Uh, 
it can be harder to interpret a scapular Y view. And so I post reduction, I always get an AP of the shoulder and an axillary view. You should also note the stability of the patient if they're falling out of the joint um, very easily. Uh, you may need to immobilize them longer or more in a more stable position, but generally speaking, you can immobilize a patient with a sling and begin gentle range of motion at two to four weeks and uh, start their rehab process. On the next slide, we'll see the uh, variety of reduction techniques. Um, these, the Stimson's technique with just gentle traction with a weight hanging off the arm uh, with a patient prone is kind of an auto reduction technique. Uh, I believe the Socratic method is the one illustrated in the upper right, which I have never used and hope to never use, but it's a possibility. If you have an assistant, they can help guide the humeral head back over the glenoid. Or on the next slide, you can see some other uh, options for uh, performing the reduction, which can be done either with an assistant or uh, with a single person. Uh, the assistant for the counter traction is really necessary only if you're having a hard time overcoming muscular force and you want to stabilize the patient so that you're not pulling them off the bed. But generally speaking, you'll need some amount of inline traction with an external rotation force to unlock that humeral head and allow it to slide back over the glenoid, uh, which is often a, a palpable clunk, but it, the shoulder is loose enough that that can be a, uh, a little difficult to evaluate. So again, the, the post-reduction x-rays are important. If we move on to the next slide, we're moving quickly, I know, but there's um, a lot of information to try to cover. Uh, proximal humerus fractures are also a very common injury. Um, in an elderly patient, they may occur with a simple fall on their outstretched hand. In a young adult, it may be the result of high energy trauma and may require an open reduction and internal fixation. Uh, pediatric injuries often occur with a fall from a height. Again, axillary nerve runs around the humeral neck uh, in this region, so noting the axillary nerve function before any of your interventions uh, is important and always get your two views. Uh, on the next slide, you can see the method of immobilization for proximal humerus fractures. The overwhelming majority can be treated non-operatively, especially in the elderly. There's been very little um, benefit shown for most injuries uh, with, with surgical management. So the most common management is either a shoulder immobilizer or a sling or a sling plus the swath, which acts as a shoulder immobilizer. You can also use a hanging arm cast, which puts some distraction force to help auto-reduce the fracture. But again, in an elderly patient, that's um, a little bit risky because their muscle tone is weaker and you may over-distract. So don't make that cast too heavy and make sure you check x-rays on a, um, a serial basis within one week to make sure that you don't have over-distraction, which could cause a non-union of the fracture. Again, the thinking of rehab, uh, you begin functional range of motion with pendulum exercises and slowly progress um, beginning at about four to six weeks as long as their pain has reduced. Similar treatment for a young adult uh, where you will again immobilize. I would prefer a hanging arm cast because putting a sling and swath, you are necessarily internally rotating the arm, which may cause an internal rotation malunion. And again, that's one of our orthopedic commandments that we're trying not to violate. But if the patient is unreliable or if you're not able to do a hanging arm cast, you have to do the best that you can do. Again, check your x-rays according to the protocol and begin range of motion when you begin to see the bony callus forming on your x-rays, again, usually by about a month. In younger children, this injury is almost always treatable just with either closed reduction or just immobilization. The uh, images shown um, on the upper right, you can see a significant displacement of this fracture through the growth plate with a metaphyseal spike consistent with a Salter-Harris II fracture. Um, over the course of time, without even a formal reduction, you can note the progression of healing and even remodeling of the deformity, uh, which is uh, encouraging because we can't always get those back in place. Um, if, if you have the ability to reduce one that is completely dissociated, that's recommended, uh, but you can treat them with the hanging arm cast, begin your x-ray routines, uh, 
and then begin range of motion again when callus is noted in, in children, it's usually by three weeks at the most. If you're unable to attain some sort of acceptable alignment, which varies based on the patient's age, uh, you can elect to fix these with either a closed or open reduction and, and percutaneous pinning. Moving to our next injury, humeral shaft fractures. Again, a common fracture. Again, most can be treated non-operatively because 90 to 95% will heal with closed treatment. However, they are a little bit difficult to manage. I, uh, I would say putting on the coaptation splint that's illustrated in, in the uh, diagram is one of the hardest things for me to do personally, uh, getting it fit well, getting it molded properly. It's important in this injury to check the function of the radial nerve. If the patient presents with a wrist drop, it may be that the radial nerve has been lacerated or impinged by the fracture fragments, especially in the Holstein-Lewis pattern as illustrated. And you can see the common deformity is for the elbow to fall into a varus position towards the body, both with the injury as well as the immobilization, especially if a patient is obese or a woman with large breasts may cause a pendulum effect uh, excuse me, may cause a fulcrum effect uh, on the, the fracture uh, itself and it will collapse into varus. So the idea behind doing the reduction here is that you place a, a sort of a U slab from the axilla all the way wrapping up to the base of the neck, uh, wrap that with a gentle compression and mold the plaster with a valgus mold as indicated by the arrows in the, in the diagram to try to keep it out of that varus alignment. Having obtained that uh, reduction, you can then begin your follow-up, and after several weeks, you can convert to a Sarmiento or a functional fracture cast, as illustrated by the um, kind of purplish-blue cast on the humerus and the young woman in the, in the picture, which allows for shoulder range of motion and even a little bit of range of motion at the elbow, depending on the, the distal extent of the fracture line. And again, most of these fractures will then go on to heal quite well and patients will have full function afterwards. Our next injury to consider is the elbow dislocation, which is the second most common uh, dislocated joint overall. These usually happen with a fall on an outstretched hand with a valgus, but sometimes also a varus load depending. Um, they're defined as either simple or complex based on whether a fracture is noted with the dislocation. In a simple elbow dislocation, the most common treatment is brief immobilization uh, after reduction. Attaining the reduction can be um, done with either sedation or even an intraarticular block. Again, depending on the age of your patient, if it's a child, you may want to pursue sedation because sticking needles in, in children who are already traumatized can be a, a challenge. The reduction itself can be done with the patient supine and uh, some gentle traction on the distal portion of the forearm and having one person holding that traction while another gently flexes the elbow and pushes the uh, olecranon over the um, trochlea to, to assist and guide that reduction. You want to try to avoid smashing the coronoid across the, the trochlea and so that the gentle guidance of that to um, to reduce the fracture is important. In a child, it is, a, it is very important to be aware of the entrapped medial epicondyle that is often avulsed uh, during the dislocation event. And because of the skeletal immaturity of children, um, if you're unsure of what the ossification centers are supposed to look like and you are doubting whether there's something entrapped in the elbow because you can't really tell, an option here is to get a comparison view of the contralateral elbow and see what growth centers are present and where they're located so that you don't miss the entrapped fragment that has been pulled into the joint as illustrated um, in this uh, photo. Hopefully it's showing up there. Yeah, the yellow arrow there shows the, uh, the entrapped fragment. Um, if that is found, that is a, a surgical injury that needs to be removed uh, as soon as possible. Assuming the reduction goes well and you've checked the range of motion and the elbow is stable enough, uh, a splint for five to seven days is all that's needed, followed by gentle range of motion to begin um, rehabilitating the patient. 
for radius and ulna shaft fractures, which are common injuries, they may be noted as both bone forearms or BBFA, again, both bone forearm fracture. Uh, generally speaking, they are surgical injuries in adults. You still should do a proper evaluation and immobilization of them, but in terms of reduction, we'll, we'll talk about that more specifically with children. Uh, they are often fall on an outstretched arm again, uh, just a slightly different mechanism than some of the previous falls, but they may be high energy injuries, especially in adults in motor vehicle collisions or falls from a uh, significant height. Here, the neurovascular exam is important to evaluate every nerve beneath, uh, below the elbow, distal to the elbow, including the anterior interosseous nerve, posterior interosseous nerve, the radial median and ulnar branches distally for both sensory and motor function. And it's important to obtain images of not just the forearm where you can see the deformity, but to include true elbow and wrist films. And I have the question why, and I think in this uh, first image, you can see that there's an obvious displaced fracture of the ulna, but what you don't see is that if you were to complete the image and advance the slide, I think we'll show the second image, that there's actually a radial head dislocation. It's a Montasia fracture dislocation. And if that is missed, as is common in children, that can have significant long-term morbidity for the patient. Similarly, with the wrist, you can have the other injury at the distal radial ulnar joint, which is a Galeazzi fracture dislocation, where the radial shaft is fractured, but the ulnar head is dislocated from the distal radial ulnar joint. Both of those are uh, challenging, and in adults are surgical. It, uh, indications in children, they may require surgery if you're unable to obtain a closed reduction. As far as the treatment on the next slide, we'll see you can give a, an adult pain meds and do a quote reduction. Again, that's just to get the best alignment you can in a temporizing splint while they wait for uh, surgery because the outcomes are far better with surgery than, than with uh, closed treatment. However, in children, you can obtain a great reduction most of the time. And so sedation is usually required because there is not an effective local anesthetic uh, for a, a, a mid shaft type injury here. Um, when the closed reduction is performed, placing a sugar tong splint is again, a use lab that goes from the base of the fingers around the elbow and back uh, on the dorsal aspect of the wrist to the base of the fingers uh, at the metacarpal phalangeal joints with a, a nice molding and good padding and post-reduction x-rays. You can cast these immediately as long as you split the cast and allow it for soft tissue expansion and swelling over the course of the next several days. Either way, you begin to follow your post-reduction protocols, following up within a week, checking the patient's neurovascular status, checking the alignment uh, and the fit of the cast or splint, et cetera. These are the types of injuries in children that may require a cast for up to 8 to 12 weeks because the more proximal the injury in the shaft of the radius and ulna, the longer it takes to heal. So again, you let your radiographs and clinical exam guide you in terms of when you're comfortable discontinuing the splint and educate your patients that they are at risk of refracture for up to a year um, after such an injury. Similarly, the distal radius and ulna fracture is a very common uh, fracture from a fall on an outstretched uh, arm or wrist. It's common in both adults and children and is often treated the same way in adults and children. And that is with a careful exam to make sure there are no open wounds that would change your management. Um, and then providing either a hematoma block, which can be done with a few cc's of one or 2% lidocaine directly injected around the fracture site. This is great for older kids or adults um, to avoid the um, need for further anesthetic. However, in young children, they again may not tolerate uh, you sticking a needle into their already injured arm. So you can either do sedation or a beer block, which requires an IV in the hand and a tourniquet on the upper arm to infiltrate local anesthetic intravenously in a sort of a regional fashion. Closed reduction can be performed by distracting the injury, over exaggerating the deformity and trying to lift that broken fragment back up on top and kind of perch it back on top of the, uh, the proximal segment. And then applying a well-molded splint as illustrated in the sugar tong splint in the, uh, the drawing here. <clears throat> 
One exception to note in children is a buccal fracture, which is usually just a small crease in the dorsal cortex, most commonly, um, of a distal radius, sometimes distal radius and ulna in a child, um, is a stable injury and doesn't require a formal reduction or a splint. If you're comfortable placing a short arm cast, this is um, uh, the one exception where I, I will routinely place a short arm cast acutely and have the patient follow up in three weeks rather than coming weekly because there's no reduction to follow. Uh, by the three weeks, you can discontinue the cast, check an x-ray, ensure that there's some evidence of healing, and then release the child. Um, and that, is, that will save them the cost of further splinting as well as the cost of travel to and from your clinic. We've completed the upper extremity, and now we're moving to less common but extremely significant injuries in the lower extremity. So these are the sort of ones that uh, get orthopedic surgeons up out of bed. Uh, that's gonna be hip dislocation as well as knee dislocations, but we'll start with the hip. Uh, it is a high energy injury to, to dislocate the most stable joint in the, um, in the body uh, usually requires either a road traffic accident of some kind, motorcycle or a dashboard injury in a car or a fall from a height. And there may be associated acetabular or femoral head fractures or injuries. Uh, so they're important to evaluate carefully. These are considered orthopedic emergencies in adults and children because time is cartilage and one of the feared outcomes is either chondrolysis leading to post-traumatic arthritis, uh, which can cause significant morbidity, or avascular necrosis due to compromise of the blood supply to the femoral head through tension on the, the blood vessels. It is very important to document your sciatic nerve function both before and after reduction. A certain number of patients will have a, a foot drop injury um, related to injury of the perineal branch of the sciatic nerve with the initial injury itself. And so if you document that beforehand, it'll help you to not have anxiety about whether you've caused it by re your reduction if the patient has a foot drop post-reduction. Uh, initial management, aside from your exam and your trauma workup, is to, at a minimum, have an AP pelvis to show which direction the hip is dislocated. Uh, and you may also get Jude views, which are specialized x-rays, but those usually happen after the reduction, as well as the CT. There's no point in obtaining the CT of the pelvis uh, in and of itself in, until the hip has been relocated so you can evaluate if the hip is concentrically reduced and if there are any intraarticular fragments or large fractures that would require surgery. It is absolutely vital that you have adequate sedation and or relaxation in order to perform the reduction because again, these are powerful muscles around the hip girdle and it's an inherently stable joint so you, you need to counteract that with good leverage and uh, good technique, um, which I don't have particular demonstration of the um, reduction maneuver, but verbally it's typically a, an axial traction, so pulling traction on a flexed hip with a combination of adduction, bringing the, the, the knee toward the midline of the patient, uh, and internally rotating to again, unlock the position of the hip and allow it to slide over the posterior uh, acetabular rim. And it's usually associated with a very satisfying clunk, uh, hopefully without much grinding you know, with that clunk. After reduction, again, CT is mandatory. And if there are entrapped fragments, the patient needs to either go directly to the OR or at least be put in traction to decompress the um, pressure on the cartilage. If it's stable, you can give a patient protected weight bearing for four to six weeks uh, with hip precautions, meaning that they should not repeat the maneuver that you just did by uh, flexing their hip too far or adducting or crossing their legs or pivoting on that leg until they've had a chance to heal their soft tissues. Uh, you may also want to repeat the x-ray before you advance their activities. At the end of this talk, hopefully we'll get to some methods of discussing traction, uh, which is important for those injuries as well. In pediatric patients, um, femoral shaft fractures are quite common and they're really the only ones that we routinely treat with a closed uh, method. Uh, 
So this primarily uh, is going to be about pediatric fractures. However, if there were medical complications uh, or comorbidities in a patient, there may be other reasons that you would treat an adult with a femoral shaft fracture non-operatively, but generally speaking, they will be treated with an intermedullary nail as soon as possible. Um, however, in children, um, femoral shaft fractures uh, are a high energy injury, so they do require a trauma evaluation. Uh, if the mechanism is suspicious, you may need to consider a family evaluation. But um, in order to adequately treat these patients, again, you're performing your routine exams, trauma workup, and then give some sedation for a closed reduction in spica casting versus traction placement with a delayed spica. The younger the child, zero to five, uh, I should say one year to five years, generally speaking, immediate spica cast placement is appropriate. If they're a little bit older, you may require um, a short period of traction to allow um, the early fracture callus to develop and give some provisional stability so that when you place the spica cast, you have an acceptable alignment. It's important to understand that in children, because they grow and the healing response stimulates further growth, you actually intentionally allow for up to two centimeters of shortening in the cast, um, as well as a, a planned external rotation and valgus molding on the cast, again, trying to prevent our varus or internal rotation deformities. The shortening allows for that overgrowth to occur without um, significantly affecting limb length, uh, and it's acceptable in children up to six, six years of age. Beyond that, we begin treating patients more commonly uh, with surgical intervention. Uh, again, we'll talk about traction um, in its specifics in a few minutes, but that is another method of treatment for these injuries. Distal femoral fractures tend to be low energy injuries in elderly patients. However, they may be a very high energy injury, especially in a young adult or, or a child. Um, if it's in a young adult, definitely a full trauma evaluation is warranted. In the low energy sports type injuries in children, this is often either a Salter Harris 1 injury where it's a clean break through the growth plate or a Salter Harris 2 as illustrated here by this image with the large metaphyseal spike of bone. And it's functionally equivalent to an adult knee dislocation because of the, the tight tethering of neurovascular structures around the knee. This type of displacement um, has a high associated risk of compartment uh, syndrome, neurovascular injury to either the perineal or popliteal um, nerve or vessels, respectively. So it's an emergent thing to, um, to evaluate, uh, make sure you understand that their, their neurovascular exam, and then give sedation and perform a closed reduction and place either straight side splints with, with or without a back slab to support the limb uh, if it's a minimally displaced fracture, you can consider a long leg cast. Again, I wouldn't do that if there's uh, significant swelling or if there's concern that it was displaced enough and unstable enough to require surgery. Typically, it's a temporizing measure and, and closed reduction with pinning will be performed in the operating room uh, when uh, an appropriate team and resources are available. In adults, uh, knee dislocation is again a similar injury to what we just evaluated, but in this case it's usually the result of multiple ligaments being uh, disrupted. And this is considered an orthopedic emergency and, in, and indeed one of the severe limb-threatening injuries. Most often it's a high-energy injury. Think motorcycle accidents or uh, again a dashboard type injury could cause this, but there are also sports-related injuries with um, certain types of pivots or pivot and a load that can cause uh, significant disruption to the ligaments around the knee as well as uh, neurovascular structures. So again, compartment syndrome uh, is a high risk. Neurovascular checks prior to post-reduction and then serially for at least a day or sometimes two days afterwards are very important to ensure that the patient has adequate blood flow and that their, their nerves are working and or recovering. After the reduction, stability of, and ligamentous exam should be done while the patient is comfortable. Uh, and then 
side splints, again, with or without a posterior slab along the back of the leg, can be applied with the knee in slight flexion to take uh, pressure off of the posterior structures. Um, but if it's extremely unstable, um, an external fixator should be applied immediately. Uh, this, the reduction is performed under, usually under sedation and is often not that hard uh, unless there's an, uh, an ir irreducible dislocation, which is rare, but typically just some firm but gentle traction applied at the ankle and pulling in line with a gentle either flexion or extension of the knee, depending on the deformity. And the knee will, um, again, very satisfactorily slide over and there will be both a palpable and sometimes audible clunk uh, as the knee reduces, at least grossly reduces, and then uh, can be maintained in a position of reduction. Again, check your x-rays, a true AP and lateral uh, knee radiograph to ensure that you don't have persistent subluxation is important. In children, it's important to be aware of the uh, proximal tibia fracture, which is through the growth plate, the tibial tubercle. That can be elevated uh, and be equivalent to a, um, an ACL injury, uh, which is high, at high risk for compartment syndrome and can also be associated with knee dislocations. Similarly, a medial tibial plateau fracture as the equivalent um, mechanism of injury of a knee dislocation. So being aware when that is seen that you need to perform neurovascular checks is also important. Okay, quickly on tibia fractures. They're the most common long bone fractures. We see them day in and day out at Tenwick Hospital from the motorcycle accidents. They're less common in children, more common in adults. It's very important to check for wounds anytime a tibia fracture is seen because there's very little soft tissue surrounding the anterior uh, borders of the tibia. So any wound has to be considered an open fracture until proven otherwise. Evaluate with radiographs, give either pain meds or sedation, and then perform a closed reduction or and placement of a long RJ splint, Robert Jones splint, which is a long posterior slab splint with side stirrups going above the knee to immobilize the knee and the ankle and obtain post-reduction radiographs. In children, getting 50% uh, overlap uh, apposition of the, of the two fragments with less than 10 degrees of residual deformity in the AP or lateral planes is acceptable and they can be treated uh, closed. In adults, most of the time, we're planning for intramedullary fixation, um, but we still have exceptions where patients either can't afford surgery or, or are not uh, medically appropriate for surgery. And so we try to attain a similar alignment um, with emphasis on minimizing any varus deformity or internal rotation deformity, and then following uh, closed fracture uh, protocols. For ankle fractures and dislocations, these are also important to examine carefully for soft tissue and neurovascular injuries because the um, uh, posterior tibial vessel and uh, runs just around the medial si side of the ankle joint and can be tethered uh, in ankle fracture dislocations. And again, there's not very much soft tissue around the medial and lateral malleoli of the ankle, so it's not uncommon to have open injuries. There are unique patterns in children that require special attention and are, are separate talks in and of themselves, but just recognize that um, careful attention is required because they have a higher risk of either growth disturbance or development of arthritis. Ankle um, fractures are somewhat unique in that we usually try to obtain at least three views of the ankle, an AP, a lateral, and what's called a mortise view, which is uh, where the ankle is internally rotated 15 degrees uh, with an AP projection to, uh, to assess the congruity of the tibiotalar joint and look for any subluxation or residual displacement. That's important before reduction, but more so after reduction and immobilization. So uh, how to obtain a reduction? Uh, this on the next slide, you'll see um, an example of a pre and post reduction pediatric ankle fracture, hopefully illustrating again the point of a crooked cast. You can see there's a, a definite curvature to the plaster on the far right um, with a, a well-molded splint um, with an indentation on the medial border of the tibia and then low on the lateral lateral 
lower lateral malleolus. So my way of remembering that is just to say low hand lateral. In 95% of the time, you'll be correct in your molding position if you say low hand lateral, high hand medial, and place your mold in that uh, fashion. In order to accomplish this, you can use, again, intraarticular block uh, with lidocaine injected directly into the ankle joint or sedation. Closed reduction is performed by, again, distracting the injury with a little bit of uh, longitudinal traction, kind of overemphasizing the deformity, and then gently but uh, firmly taking the, the distal portion of the hind foot uh, and guiding it back up over underneath the um, distal tibia. This can also be held in that position with the knee in slight flexion and the uh, uh, great toe being held by an assistant in internal rotation that kind of locks the position there and you can then apply your splint uh, similar to the tibia fracture, a, a side splints with a back slab and stirrups there uh, and mold it well over the the bony prominences and pad it well. Again, get your post-reduction x-rays to ensure that you have put your mold in the right place and you don't have cast wrinkles uh, and instruct the patient to elevate uh, for several days and then follow your treatment protocols as outlined previously. In the last couple minutes, I just want to briefly touch on traction. There are several types of traction, mainly uh, you can think of it as distal femoral or proximal tibia traction. Occasionally, a distal tibia or transcalcaneal traction can be placed. And then there's special cases of skin traction or 90-90 traction, which we'll show briefly. For distal femoral traction, the indications on the next slide, you'll see um, both indications as well as an illustration of how to place the traction pin. Hip dislocations that are either unstable or have entrapped fragments. Uh, unstable pelvic fractures or femur fractures, but not femur fractures with femoral neck fractures because you do not want to place undue tension on a femoral neck and displace it or uh, cause tension on the capsule and cause uh, a compromise to the blood flow. The technique is to enter from medial and progress to lateral with a, a shans pin or a thin wire traction, whatever you have uh, at your facility. Um, the neurovascular structures are closest to the medial side, so you uh, dissect down gently with a, um, a hemostat, find the, the medial border of the femoral cortex, and advance your pin from medial to lateral out through the skin. Generally, this is done a finger breadth above and about two finger breadths medial to the superior border of the patella to put it in an appropriate place, and you want that to be level to the floor parallel to the joint line as illustrated in the picture. Tibial traction is used also for femur fractures, especially if it's a distal femoral fracture where you don't feel comfortable getting your pin in the distal femoral segment. Um, and you can use it for pelvic fractures. However, there is a major caveat to this. You should never place tibial traction on the ipsilateral side with a known ligamentous injury of the knee. So it's important to know if you have a knee ligament injury, you should not place traction through that joint for risk of distracting it and causing tension on uh, the neurovascular structures around the knee. This is just the opposite of femoral traction in that the neurovascular structures pass most closely to the lateral side. So you want to do your careful soft tissue manipulation there, make a small incision and dissect down to the lateral border of the tibia and place it uh, about two finger breaths, two to three centimeters distal and one or two finger breaths uh, lateral to the tibial tubercle should put you in a position to go directly through the diaphysis of the um, tibia without skiving through the anterior cortex and potentially causing a, a fracture. Skin traction is just a temporary measure that's often used in children but can also be used in adults either for transport or for just um, temporary immobilization um, working on the same principle of hanging weight off the distal extremity. The most common problem with this, however, is that it is traction directly on the skin and can cause shearing and cause blisters. But the technique is to take a stirrup. There are commercially available ones, or you can fashion one where there's a stirrup around the hind foot that is um, wrapped 
circumferentially up to the knee, and then a, a loop of, of traction uh, rope and weight is applied up to five kilos or 10% body weight, usually whichever one is less to avoid soft tissue injuries. So again, monitor your neurovascular status uh, afterwards. Finally, uh, again, this 90-90 traction on the uh, last slide is um, something that's often used for children uh, that can't undergo surgery if there's a pathologic fracture or if there's a situation where funding is an issue and they can stay in, inpatient but can't go to surgery. And this is a, too elaborate to explain in detail other than to just say if you have pulleys and, and bars, you can place a distal femoral traction pin and suspend the leg in a position of, of good alignment, which is about 90 degrees hip flexion, 90 degrees of knee flexion. Check your rotational alignment, make sure that the heel isn't crossing over towards the other leg and that the uh, leg isn't collapsing into varus. And you have to check portable x-rays. So another requirement to do this properly is to have a portable x-ray machine. Otherwise you're just going based on clinical gross alignment maintain um, this position, have the patient uh, monitored for any skin pressure areas because they'll be immobilized in bed, and then it can be converted over to a spica cast uh, after several weeks, usually two to three, and when you see some callus formation and it's stable. So I hope that gives you uh, a, a good overview of common injuries you may see either in the field or in an emergency department. Um, I've listed some references as well as some resources. Uh, OrthoBullets and Wheelis Online have great um, basic overview summary material for numerous um, orthopedic injuries and treatments. And the Handbook of Fractures is every resident's uh, survival guide. Um, if anyone has ever seen it or would uh, sees an, a great number of musculoskeletal injuries in their environment, I would highly recommend a copy of this book because uh, it also gives some pointers on technique uh, and how to how to do some of the blocks and things like that. Uh, so with that, I'd like to wrap up and uh, say thank you once again and uh, entertain some questions if there are any. Now, I have, this is uh, Dr. Wood again, uh, Tom Wood. Um, Dylan, I'd like to thank you for your presentation today. It was great. And, uh, you know, uh, there were no questions that were in the chat window. So if any of you have questions, I would urge you to put those forward. <clears throat> I do have one question for you, and that is, uh, you know, how did you get into the program that led you to being assigned to uh, Tenwick uh, for anybody else out there that might be interested in that? So uh, I think you're referring to the post-residency program? Correct. Um, I was actually told by Dr. Dan Gallett about the program um, at the time that my wife and I were uh, evaluating missions opportunities during the latter half of my residency. Um, and we were trying to understand how I could serve as an orthopedic surgeon, and we found his blog. Um, got in touch with him and he explained what he was doing. He had also done the post-residency program and had been at Tenwick uh, prior to my arrival. So he encouraged us as a, as a means to launch ourselves into the mission field to apply to the post-residency program. And uh, to, to do so, we, we went online, found the application, started uh, the process with Samaritan's Purse and uh, from there, the rest is history. We ended up at Tenwick uh, as we, we felt God leading us there. And uh, we really enjoyed our time with Samaritan's Purse and the post-residency program. All right. Uh, I see there's still, you know, your presentation was so thorough that I don't see many questions. Let's see now. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, a, uh, one of the viewers uh, is saying, do you have all the radiologic equipment in Kenya? Hmm. It's a great question. Um, we, we do have everything we need in terms of, uh, we have an older CT scanner, which helps. Uh, hopefully it will be upgraded in the near future. Uh, we do have fluoroscopic uh, machines for intraoperative imaging. Uh, at some point, we would love to get a portable small machine, a, a mini C-arm for the purpose of checking reductions uh, kind of real time. Uh, 
But other than that, we do have uh, radio, radiographs uh, that are portable and digital um, possibilities. So we can um, do our reductions, check post-reduction x-rays. Um, Make do with what you've got. OK, do we have any more questions out there? I wanted to thank you again uh, for an excellent presentation. I wanted to remind the viewers, uh, you know, the people that have joined us today, uh, that there is a continuing medical education credit available for this. Uh, the information on how to apply for that will be, uh, you know, conveyed in the, uh, the, the follow-up email that comes out to all, everybody who's subscribed uh, following the presentation along with uh, you know the, uh, the the link to uh, to the website where they can go in and, and view the presentation again if they would like it so thank you a lot for that and i see that you are scheduled to go back to uh 10 week in 2020 so the, the lord's calling you back yes okay now a good place to raise children <laughs> absolutely all right thank you very much uh, thank you yeah, I did not open us in prayer. I want to close us in prayer, uh, you know, and and uh, thank all of those who tuned in and to remind your, you know, your uh, friends and acquaintances that that the webinar uh, is available uh, online and will be uh, through a link that will be sent out to you all. And you can share that. We don't, you know, we would encourage you to do that and encourage others to join us. It's a great forum. Uh, I uh, have been... I, you know, was instrumental with uh, Lance Plyler in getting this set up in the beginning. It's been, uh, Dr. Plyler, it's been his dream to have this, uh, you know, this seminar, this webinar, and, and I want to encourage it. And it's, it's a great opportunity for, you know, for people to see, one, what's available out there, and two, how to do the best job the Lord leads you to do. So, so thank you for that. And if you will join me, I will close this in prayer. Now, Father God, uh, we just give you praise. You are our God. Your son, Jesus, is our Savior. Uh, Lord, this is the season when we uh, celebrate his first coming. Look forward to his second. And uh, Lord, uh, give you praise for that. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit and Dr. Dillon and uh, Dr. Nugent's life. And with this, we'd ask you to extend your protection over him and his family as they prepare to go back to Tenwick. Uh, Lord, and be with each of us. Uh, as we uh, go about our day, that we can be witnesses for you in this world that we find ourselves. Okay, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, amen. So, 